Hi friends, Dr. Swami Vantrapali from Attune Health. I wanted to bring you an update on COVID. It's been a while since we recorded an update on COVID. Uh, to be honest, I kind of had uh, fatigued out of COVID, but I'm here with good news. Uh, California has declared that the pandemic is finally over, which is exciting for most people. And I wanted to take this opportunity to um, talk to you a little bit about what's going on. So right now, as you can see from some of these graphs, that uh, COVID is actually in the decline. And, um, you know, our current variants that we have are the XBB 1.5, which accounts for approximately 74% of cases. But despite it being really infectious, what we really realize is that there was no spike in the winter hospitalization spike that we've been seeing over the last few years. So that's really good news. So thankfully, it appears that the Omicron and the new variants that are in circulation and that have become extremely infectious are not as dangerous and don't cause as much hospitalization as before. And I think that's really a very positive piece of information that we need to hold on to. So when you see media reports that there's immune escape and the variants are getting worse, what they're talking about is that they're becoming more infectious. But that doesn't translate to more hospitalizations, and that's the message that I want to give you. So in terms of other uh, news, um, ACR's updated guidelines on uh, COVID were recently released. And basically, this is about vaccines and what medicines people who have uh, rheumatic diseases should hold prior to vaccination. So not a lot of change. Uh, with the steroids, we're not recommending any change in the dosage. With methotrexate, we're saying hold the methotrexate for two weeks after the vaccine. And similarly for JAK inhibitors. And lastly, for rituxan, which actually lowers the efficacy of a vaccination. We're recommending that you take the vaccine about four weeks before the six-month mark when your next dose is due. So those are the updates from the ACR vaccine guidance. In terms of um, COVID and its subvariants uh, responding to Evyshel, a lot of our patients were using Evyshel, which was a great vaccine alternative. It was actually giving you all the monoclonal antibodies in a prophylactic manner. Unfortunately, Evyshel is no longer efficacious and we're no longer recommending it to our patients uh, with autoimmune diseases who cannot take a vaccine because the currently circulating variants are not susceptible to Evyshel. In terms of um, the bivalent COVID vaccines, I've been getting so many questions about this. I've been really reading a lot of the literature and trying to figure out what's the best way to discuss this very controversial topic. Um, I turn to um, Paul Offit, who I think is one of the leading researchers from an infectious disease perspective, and he wrote a very influential um, editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine in February, just a couple of weeks ago, which I reviewed, and I really respected his point of view. Uh, when the FDA panel made their uh, recommendations, there was no human data. Um, but since the FDA approved it, there have been two studies, one by David Ho and his group, and one by Dan Barouche and his group, which showed that the monovalent vaccines, the original vaccines, had a fair amount of neutralizing antibody titers, and doing a bivalent um, booster did not really uh, elicit a, any superior um, immune response. That's a really fascinating question that um, immunologists have really pondered about, right? We don't expect this because bivalent, two different subtypes, should give you better uh, vaccine um, antibodies against the, the second variant. But that's not happening in real life. And that's where biology is so fascinating and immunology is so fascinating because, you know, we can't really predict these things unless we try them in humans. And one of the theories as to why this might happen, and I'm not going to go into detail because it's kind of beyond the scope of a talk of this nature, but there's this concept known as imprinting. So patients have already been exposed to the monovalent vaccines or they've had COVID infections. So their B and their T cells have already been primed against those. So when you add a bivalent vaccine with a new antigenic epitope, the imprinting from the previous viral triggers seems to override the new um, bivalent vaccine. So I'll stop there about that particular topic, but you know, it's, it's pretty fascinating and as rheumatologists and immunologists tend to geek out on that. The other uh, question is, um, should you know, uh, patients be getting the uh, bivalent booster? Uh, 
So I showed you a little bit of data that there's not a huge uh, impact from the bivalent versus monovalent, but it's available and I certainly have no objection if somebody wants to take the uh, bivalent uh, booster. But several studies now show that the efficacy is pretty short-lived. You know, it's, it's probably two or three months or so. And the question about what we're really interested in knowing is whether vaccines prevent hospitalization. And here, you know, the um, data is kind of mixed. The, there was a large cohort study which was published again in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is uh, our premier journal. And here, uh, they tested uh, the, uh, uh, it was a cohort study, it wasn't a randomized controlled trial, which is considered the gold standard. And uh, they tested whether or not people had less hospitalization after the bivalent boosters as opposed to having less hospitalization after the monovalent boosters came um, about. And they did some really complex mathematical modeling and they had some beautiful graphs and uh, things like that to show um, their interpretation was that the bivalent booster was about 58% effective against hospitalization compared to 25% reduction in hospitalization of the monovalent vaccine. However, um, epidemiologists have looked at this um, article and tore it apart, even though it's published in our premier journal, as being uh, somewhat of a modeling uh, methodology rather than a true effect. And I tend to fall in that camp feeling that this data is not compelling or doesn't move me, and I'm certainly not impressed in any way that the boosters are preventing hospitalization or death at this point in time in the pandemic. So in terms of should you get a bivalent booster, I don't have an objection to most of my patients getting it, but I do want to say that there's not a lot of data to support that you actually need it. And I base this on um, what's going on in the ground. I mean, the ground reality is that winter of 2022, 23, we did not have a hospitalization spike at all. So that we're starting off at a good uh, place. now. What are my uh, conclusions based on all this uh, data? For the vast majority of patients, I think it's time to go and live your lives normally. Even California, which has had the most stringent restrictions, has now declared the pandemic ended. I think we need to take people seriously, the California government seriously, when they say, yes, it's pretty much the pandemic is done. We're now in an endemic phase. We're going to have some variants. And so far, thankfully, it's looking like the new variants are pretty benign and not really causing a lot of havoc and hospitalization, which is a great thing. Um, the um, high-risk groups, however, do need to remain vigilant. And when I talk about high-risk groups, I'm talking about people on uh, severe immunosuppression. So if you're a lung transplant or a cardiac or renal transplant patient, uh, if you're on rituximab, if you're on JAK inhibitors, which are uh, drugs that we use in rheumatology, or if you're immunosuppressed because of whatever other condition you might have, that's high risk, as is an obese person, as is an elderly person. And elderly, you know, uh, um, the definition varies in the literature, uh, but I think anyone over 80 for sure, but, you know, perhaps somebody over 70, and then some authorities say even over 60, you need to be cautious. I think that might be pushing too far in one direction when you say 60-year-olds are elderly because I'm, I'm not sure that their outcomes are that much worse. So um, the other point I want to make is that um, in March 2020, when we had uh, our first encounter with COVID-19 in the U.S., uh, things were different. We were dealing with an unknown virus that had never been experienced by humans, and human uh, immune systems, when they came in contact with this virus, was literally freaking out. I mean, the immune system was overreacting to a virus it had never seen or experienced, and this was causing a lot of immunological spillover. And most of the deaths that we were seeing at that time were because of an overactive immune system. But through natural infection and through vaccination, which I think vaccines have been very e efficacious in this regard, these immune responses have attenuated over time. And so the human immune system is able to deal with COVID much easier, much better, without a lot of spillover effects to patients. So I think that we're in a much different place in March 2023 than we were in March 2020, and we need to recognize that. We need to understand that. I see a lot of people every day, and I see people who are stuck in thinking as though it is March 2020, and they're still behaving like that. And I really think it's not good, because what we're finding is that the 
effects of COVID are not just from the virus, but the isolation that people have experienced, the depression that people have experienced, the lack of medical care that they've put off because of the pandemic, those are all now starting to come back and bite us. And it's time for us to recognize that, take action at an individual level and at a societal level. Uh, I don't want my comments to be interpreted that everything's laissez-faire and, you know, go back to being, doing whatever you want, but, you know, it's a cautious optimism that I want to convey to you. Thank you for your attention.